Hello, church family. Grace and peace to you from God our Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I truly hope that you're all well and encouraged and finding ways to comfort one another and finding ways to use this time uh, to your best ability and for God's glory. I want to take a few minutes to update you on a few things. First of all, on Sundays, hopefully you're able to tune in. We're live streaming still at 9 a.m. And just with a skeleton crew, uh, just enough there to pull off the live stream. Uh, we've been averaging about 260 or so uh, independent links. That's not individuals. Sometimes that's family. So that's great. The vast majority of you are, are tuning in. And then we have others from other places who are doing so. We get some 500 plus hits uh, at the website. Some people are watching afterwards. I think in the next few weeks, we're going to try and do is get the get the service uploaded and, and back up there so you can observe it later. If you can't tune in at 9, we should have it up by 11.45 or so. And it won't be live per se, but it'll be still from the very same day. So if some of you do that, that may work out also by having less people streaming at 9 a.m. In regards to the condition of our church family, the elders and the deacons and deaconesses have spoken to almost all who are 65 and older. The few that we haven't is just because we couldn't reach them, uh, messages were left, and so far everyone's okay that we've spoken with. In one case, uh, we did uh, have to deliver some food to a family, and uh, to a couple, and uh, that may be something that needs to keep uh, going on. Our community groups, as of this point, Around a third of them or so are meeting uh, online through various platforms. Uh, and some of them are sharing that on Facebook. We really want to encourage those of you who uh, are in community groups that you're not meeting yet. If you're one of those leaders, just try and find a way to stay in touch with people. If you need help on how to do this with a computer platform, be glad to do that. One community group is currently going to be serving at a food bank this week. Listen, God is doing things in the lives of people. Uh, more than one of the community groups have shared uh, with Scott that uh, this has been some of the best uh, interaction that they've had in their groups as a result of having to do all this uh, during this stressful time. And so let me encourage you to keep that up. Um, testimonies. Uh, one of the contractors in our church uh, is working for a client to and because of this, he's in the house with this couple, and he's been able to share Christ with them and to speak with them. Uh, one of them has a familiarity with the scripture. The other one does not. Uh, another couple uh, took some funds of their own, not our benevolent funds, but their own benevolence out of their love and gave it to one of their neighbors who had lost their jobs and had uh, two children. And while they did this, uh, their parents were there visiting, and they couldn't believe that anybody would um, uh, you know express love in such a tangible way and that's from their neighborhood so the Lord is doing things I hope he's doing things in each of your lives uh, someday when we get to heaven we'll understand all the things that God did but right now it's great to hear of some of the things so be sure to share some testimonies I heard that the parents called later to speak with again that couple and say they just couldn't believe it how grateful they were that they did this we've been in touch with our mission partners around the world and so far all is well with with all of them you know mexico honduras costa rica essentially the same uh, shelter in place type of quarantine is going on uh, in costa rica three of, of the people connected with the church plant in the northwest part of that country had lost their jobs they're all connected to the tourism i think it was about two weeks ago costa rica shut down their borders completely uh, and that's by land by sea and by air and so of course that just strangled the uh, tourist industry so we need to be praying for them in Honduras they've canceled the classes at Meta they're trying to find a way to get online they were not all prepared to do that uh, from the Christophers we hear in South Africa that uh, they're not in quite as tight a quarantine as we are but nevertheless they're being reduced uh, he's had to pause all his trips and Pause his work on the seminary he's hoping to start there. Uh, in, in Hawaii, we hear from Ray Palampo that the churches are indeed closed there under a similar quarantine. And then here at home, Harold Albert, uh, the jail is close to him. He can't go there, though other um, 
other chaplains can because he's considered high risk. So we want to pray for that ministry. And then Craig and Lisa, who are serving overseas, are currently here at home. They came here for uh, surgery for him, follow up on his heart, and that's had to be canceled. So we want to pray for them. All in all, I think we're going to hear more about our mission partners in a month or so as this as this gets tighter and tighter and things become more difficult. And I think the same will be true here at home. At this point, there's no big rush for our benevolent fund, but that's it's going to be, be a reality here shortly. We know that some are in the Hispanic ministry uh, needing help already, and I know that some of you are going to find yourselves in that place as well. I'd like us to consider about something I said last, last week, and that was that for you and me as Christians, that these trials are never purposeless, that our God is always doing something. He's at work in the difficulties that we face in life, and that should always bring us great encouragement. But I want to provide some backbone to that from James chapter 1, from that very familiar section there. Let me read it to each of you first, and then I just want to explain three things briefly from it. James, who is the brother of our Lord, writes and says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. He goes on and says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Why? He goes on and says he's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Then he says, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of this pursuit. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then, then desire, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and perfect gift uh, is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change of his own will. He brought us forth by the word of truth that we may be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now, I read a whole lot there, but I don't want to talk about all of that. But there is some connection I want to make. You know, you know, difficult times like this make people evaluate their lives, evaluate their priorities, evaluate how they've been living and their use of time. Even an unbeliever, I heard a testimony of this week that was cared for so much and so well by people in the hospital that his his statement was that he is forever changed by the way these people cared for him. And what about us? We who have the grace of God in our lives, we who know the grace and mercy of God and have the Holy Spirit living within us, we more so should be transformed by trials and tribulations and difficulties such as these. Um, you know, troubles make people respond in different ways, sometimes in funny ways, and it really brings what's in their heart out. Uh, some people, and I'm talking about Christians or people who make a profession of faith, become resentful when they when they fall in times like these. Others become fearful. Others, for others, the joy is gone completely, uh, and their only desire is to escape the trial. You know, at the, towards the end of this book, James writes the very last verse. Really, he says, "If anyone among you wanders from the truth." And that may be the motive for why he wrote everything in this book. People were wondering, and he was wondering, and he was concerned about that. And trials make some people indeed begin to wander. They get distance from God in their heart, you know. And so as we just read, he says, don't be deceived. 
When you find yourselves in trials, don't say God's testing me in the sense that he's trying to get me to sin. He's not. He would never do that. Don't think about that. And so this is a time for us to re evaluate, reevaluate, reconsider three main things that he says here. Our trials, uh, our, our response, and our treasure. Think about those three things with me for a few moments here. Whatever you think of all this, consider that God is doing something. He is producing something. Verse 2, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet various kind of trials, for you know, and this is something you should know, and consider that the testing of your faith produces produces steadfastness or endurance, your translation may say, and let steadfastness have its full effect. In other words, that's not the final goal. The final goal is what? That you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. God is producing something in your life and in my life through this. We need to be convinced of that. He's producing steadfastness, the ability to hold up under pressure, under great weight. And we need that. We need that in order to press on with, with life all the time. We need that in order to be better parents and better singles and better employers, employees, and Christians in this world and not wander from the truth. And the full effect of it is, is that we would be perfect. And that word means brought to its maturity. It's not talking about sinless um, perfection here. Remember, Romans 8, 29 says that he is conforming us uh, into the image of his very son. And so it's not joyful to be in the trial. That is, the pain itself is not joyful. But the reality that God is at work should be able to bring us joy. It'd be like going back to the gym in a long time. Uh, maybe that's the case with some of you. Maybe you're starting to work out now that you're home. I know gyms are closed, but when you go, when you go back to the gym after a long time, you should be thinking in your mind, this is going to be painful, but it's going to be profitable. It's going to be fruitful. It's going to be helpful. And that's how we need to think rightly uh, when we review, when we're going through trials such as this, you know. And so trials enable us to, to bring an end to this lie in our lives that we are self-sufficient, that we don't need anything, that we're done. We're not. We need to grow. And when your life doesn't meet your expectations, and maybe that's what's happening right now for some of you, when your life doesn't meet expectations, think about this. What is God doing here? He's doing, he's working something in my life. Now, some trials are very difficult, and I get that. And I don't want to be glib about it, and the Bible certainly isn't. It's realistic. Uh, some people suffer very difficult things on a chronic level. And you don't want to just run up to them with James chapter 1, verse 2, you know, and just say, consider it all joy. There's more to it. Some trials are very difficult. And so what we need to, what we need is we need to consider our response and our decisions at that time. And that's why he says, when those trials come, he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. The context here is wisdom in the trial, wisdom in the time of suffering, he says. Ask God. Of all the things you do, ask God. These trials, I know, is going to force many of you, if not all of you, to make some decisions here very soon. There's going to be some repercussions to all this. And so he says, ask God. Don't forget, prayer is a privilege you and I have. Ask God, what do I do with this? What, do I, what am I supposed to do with this mess? You know, Don't struggle against God. Ask God, and he will answer you. He says he will give it to you without reproach. What's that mean? That means he's not waiting to scold you. He's not waiting to say to you, well, here you come again, or there you go again. Or, he's not waiting to reprimand you. He's re ready to freely give you and me the wisdom we need to endure this trial and make decisions that this is going to bring about in our life. But we need to come with authenticity. You know, there is a but in here. And he says, uh, essentially, don't be like someone who's double-minded. Meaning, meaning, don't come to God, say you're sincere that you want his wisdom, when you're really not prepared to do what he's going to tell you to do. Uh, we can't be like uh, that one character in Pilgrim's Progress, uh, Mr. Facing Both Ways. You know, We have to face one way or the other. So maybe we begin there. Lord, give me sincerity of heart in Christ to accept what I'm going to learn in this. 
and then follow what you teach me through all this. Remember, he's not our genie. He's our father. And so this is a time to reevaluate our trials, how we think of them, our response to them, remembering we should seek wisdom. And lastly, a time to reevaluate our treasure, where our treasure is, whether we're poor, whether we're rich, whether we had plenty when this all hit or whether we had little with all this. Listen to the way he, that James shocks his readers. He says, he says, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. What James is doing, he's saying, in trials, we have the opportunity to evaluate where our treasure has been. And we ought to see it from God's perspective. To the one who has little, from God's perspective, he says, you have, you, you're rich. You have, you have immeasurable blessings in Christ Jesus. Consider what you possess as a Christian. Uh, and so to the rich man, he says, from God's perspective, you ought to be humbled during the trial because just like everyone else, um, you're going to pass away and you're not going to take any of that with you. You're like a flower that's going to be here today and gone tomorrow. And so this time right now that we have both as individuals and as a church family is a time again for reflection a time of growth. I'm glad that many of you are making the most of this. Uh, it's a joy to watch what some of you are posting about how your families are using the time, maybe developing new habits, spending more time together, reading together, praying together. And I realize there's a whole spectrum here too. Uh, for some of you, it's just getting unnerving. You know, you're, you're just all crunched in there. It's hard to be all together and not be able to go out and do a whole lot. Um, but this is a time now then that we can use to reevaluate, reevaluate our trials, what we think of them, reevaluate our response, uh, are we seeking the wisdom of God, and reevaluating our treasure. Do we see our possessions from God's perspective? I hope that this brief reflection, this brief, brief meditation will encourage you and help you as you consider uh, what to do during this experience. You know, these days, the faith of all of us, each one of us, is being tested. And because it's coming from God, it's for our good. He is going to strengthen us, just like going into the gym. Our God is so amazing that he can bring good out of, the, out of what is ugly. Something beautiful out of what is ugly. Good out of what is bad. It was the Puritan Thomas Watson who once made this statement and it stuck with me. He said that God, and I'm paraphrasing him here at this point, God is so great that he could use poison to heal us. And maybe that's what he's going to do for our country. We should be praying for a great awakening here and for the gospel to, to ignite uh, many hearts and for him to use what seems like poison uh, for our economy and for so many to actually heal. Heal our country, heal his church, heal you and me. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. Be encouraged. Keep praying for one another. Uh, we elders love you. Uh, we think of you, we prayed for you last night, and we hope to speak to all of you soon uh, by phone one way or another until we can all meet again. God bless you.